Hello and welcome to the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center's Curator's Corner. I'm Thorin Tritter, the Museum and Programming Director at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center, which is located in Glen Cove, New York. This online program, as many of you know, is part of a series of short programs that I offer each week that look at particular objects in our exhibition at a time when our museum is still closed to the public. As always, let me encourage you, if you've got questions that come up during the course of my presentation, please use the Q&A window. You scroll your mouse along the bottom of the screen and type your question into the Q&A box, and I will respond either during my talk or at the end of my presentation. Um, and one other comment before I start, I wanted to thank everyone who's contributed to our campaign to raise money for our virtual programs this fall. While, of course, we're grateful for additional support and more people to contribute $100 gifts, I want to thank everyone who's helped make it possible for us to continue programs like this one during this fall. Okay, I'm going to talk today about a tiny x-ray that is part of a document that confirmed that God Goldman, a resident in one of the DP camps after World War II, did not have tuberculosis. tuberculosis. The document the document is displayed in a portion of our gallery that deals with the displaced person camps that were established in the wake of the war. Here you see a, the display, but it's probably difficult to see the x-ray that I'm talking about, which is on a pinkish colored paper in the middle of the, sh the screen here. Here's another view that uh, gives you a way to see this x-ray, which is only about an inch or an inch and a half or so square, so a very small item. Indeed, we're talking about a piece of film, essentially the size of a negative from an old 35 millimeter camera's film. Before I talk more about this document and the x-ray, let me thank God Goldman's daughter, Marilyn Schneider, who donated this document, along with a trove of other materials that her father held onto after the war and then saved. Marilyn told me that her father had been a reserved and quiet man who never showed these documents to her and her brother when they were growing up, but which they discovered when he passed away in 2007. The entire collection, including the x-ray and TB test that I'll talk about today, is an invaluable tool in understanding how the Holocaust unfolded and how Holocaust survivors like God Goldman restarted their lives in the aftermath of the war. So we are very grateful to Marilyn Schneider for donating these papers, and I hope today to give a sense about this one document's importance for our museum and for the larger goal of explaining the events of the Holocaust. Here's a closer look at the document. There's no label on it, there's no title, but you can see the film of the negative on the right-hand side, and you may be able to make out that it is an x-ray. Here's a um, blown up and lightened image of the negative, and I apologize, I should have thanked Marilyn and Michael Goldman, both of uh, God Goldman's children who donated these objects to the museum. Um, but here you can see the, the lightened and blown up image of the negative. I think you can see more clearly that it is a chest x-ray. And while nothing on the card says that it's proof of a TB test, the x-ray is the giveaway, as it was through a chest x-ray that doctors could determine if a person had cavities in the lungs that were caused by tuberculosis, a highly contagious disease. I'll say more about TB in a minute, but first let me go back to the card and talk about the man this belonged to. You can see the name on the card, um, as the family name Goldman is actually written in the top left rather than in the box named family name. And you can see the first name or born name, Gold, uh, God. You can also see that God Goldman's birthday was April 20th, 1913. God Goldman was born to a modern Orthodox Jewish family in Kalish, Poland in 1913. Kalish located about 80 miles west of Lodz. And here, let me say a word about his name. Uh, the person filling out this form wrote G-O-D as his first name, which may look a little strange to us. But recall, however, that God Goldman would have been speaking in Yiddish, and in Yiddish, his name would have been spelled with Hebrew letters, Gimel Dalad. 
when transliterated, you could put an O or an A, and the person here put an O, presumably, because he or she thought that sounded more like the name as God pronounced it. And just as importantly, perhaps because that was the way the Germans had spelled his name on his paperwork in the Nazi concentration camp system. In German, there was nothing surprising about spelling his name G-O-D, as the German word for God is Gott, G-O-T-T. God's daughter Marilyn told me that when God moved to America, his paperwork also said G-O-D, God Goldman, and it was both, she said, annoying and embarrassing. She said they used to get prank telephone calls at their home from people who said they were Jesus and they wanted to speak to God because in the phone book, he was listed as God Goldman, G-O-D. She even got in trouble once at school, she told me, when she wrote on some form that her father's, her father's name was God. But when, they, when she asked her teacher to check the phone book, the punishment was rescinded. Eventually, after much urging from both Marilyn and her older brother, Michael, God Goldman legally changed his name in the United States to God Goldman, G-A-D, God Goldman. But on this form and on the other paperwork from Europe, when God Goldman's name was written with English letters, it was largely spelled G-O-D. Regardless of how you spell his name, in September of 1939, at the age of 26, God was in Kalish and watched the Nazis march through the area around his home and in Lodz, and then formally annex the area to Germany, making it part of the German Reich. Only a few months later, in early 1940, word reached Kalish that the Jews in Lodz were being forced into a small portion of the city, which had been set up as an enclosed ghetto. The gates of the ghetto were closed on May 1st of 1940, and for the next few months, Jews were brought from the surrounding area, even from Lodz, uh, sorry, from Kalish, and even further away, and forced into the ghetto, including God Goldman and his family. You see here God Goldman on his working papers that were issued in the Lodge Ghetto, which I spoke about at an earlier Curator's Corner and which you can find on HMTC's YouTube channel. God Goldman, along with his parents, two sisters, and two brothers, survived in the ghetto until August of 1944 when they were all deported to Auschwitz. His parents were immediately sent to the gas chamber while he and his siblings were selected for work, although only God and one of his sisters survived. As the Red Army approached, God, who believed at that time point that he was the only surviving member of his family, was sent west, eventually to a concentration camp, camp near Schottenburg, Germany, where he was liberated in the spring of 1945. He then moved to the displaced person camp at Fehrenwald, in the southern portion of the American zone in the town of Wolfratshausen, staying there until August of the following year. At Fornwald, he met his future wife, Sylvia, who was also a survivor. He also met a man who he had known in college before the war named Stanley Abramovich, who had moved to England in 1935 and thus escaped the Holocaust. Abramovich came to Fehrenwald as a representative of the American Joint Distribution Committee, also known as the JDC or the Joint. The Joint distributed supplies in displaced persons camps, including food, medicine, clothing, tools, equipment, and much more. But the Joint also provided a range of other services, including vocational training that was designed to help survivors learn skills that they would need to find employment, whether they stayed in Europe or moved to Palestine or even other countries like the United States. In Fernwald, Abramovich, outfitted in an American army uniform, functioned as, according to his own biography, an administrator, social worker, rabbi, teacher, and logis logistician. And he needed help. And one of the su survivors who he found dependable, creative, entrepreneurial, was God Goldman. Soon God was Abramovich's right-hand man, particularly when it came to organizing the vocational training programs in Fernwald. And when Abramovich shifted his work to another smaller camp named Windsheim, located about 30 miles west of Nuremberg, he got the ORT, O-R-T, another organization working in DP camps, to hire God Goldman to run the vocational training programs there. 
An article in the camp's paper a few months later celebrated God Goldman's accomplishments in establishing a range of helpful and enjoyable training programs. It included pictures of God and the camp students, the, the, the inmates or the residents of the DP camp, that gives a sense of the range of classes being offered at Vinchheim and other DP camps. Things like radio theory and radio operation, metal working, sewing, and more than a dozen other kinds of vocational training programs. The X-ray and TB test that we have in our gallery was taken by God Goldman after he moved to his new job at Vinchheim, which you can see listed on the left side of the document. And you may be able to make out the date of the test. It's a little hidden behind some other words, but it says November 3rd, 1946. Just to fill in a bit, a bit more information about the card, the German at the top says this card must not be rolled or bent. And it also says to leave the right side free, no doubt to put in the x-ray. There are two other items that I want to point out, although you may have seen them already. The first is that the test proved negative, and indeed God Goldman was required to have this paper on him as he traveled in and out of the Vinchheim camp to prove that he was not carrying tuberculosis and spreading the highly contagious disease. The second is that the form includes a space to list the responsible health department, and in this case shows Croix Rouge Suisse, the Swiss Red Cross, although the stamp is a bit uneven. Most Americans, I think, are familiar with the American Red Cross, which was founded in 1881 by Clara Barton. I'm not sure if most are aware that Clara Barton established the American organization after learning of the Swiss Red Cross that had been established in 1866 and working with them during the Franco-Prussian War. While the American Red Cross was certainly active during and after World War II, the Swiss Red Cross, given its base in the neutral country of Switzerland, during the war was also actively involved in providing relief and services. Okay, so I think you have a good sense of the information on the card. Let me spend a couple of minutes now talking about why TB tests were such a big concern in the aftermath of the war. Tuberculosis, as I mentioned, is a highly infectious disease that's spread in the air through coughing, which is one of the symptoms of the disease. So the, the one, as you got the disease, you started coughing and that helped spread it. Tuberculosis often affects the lungs where infections create cavities that can be seen in x-rays like this example. A clear x-ray, while not a complete conclusive proof of being free of tuberculosis, is one of the key tools that was used in the 1940s to confirm a person did not have the disease. I should say that TB was not a new disease in the 1930s and 1940s. It has been around for thousands of years. Indeed, Egyptian mummies have been found with evidence of TB. Robert Koch, a German Jewish physician and microbiologist is credited with identifying the bacillus that causes tuberculosis in 1882. It won him the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1905. Koch's work came at a time when the disease remained one of the major killers in Europe often known as consumption. It was linked to poverty and urban slums, which had emerged in the 19th century in a new level, mostly because malnutrition and overcrowding were keys to the spread, spread of the disease. So people who were poor and lived in slums, that's where the disease could spread most readily. It accounted for 25% of all deaths in England in 1815 and one in six deaths in France 100 years later in 1918. The treatment in the 19th century was to send those with tuberculosis to sanatoriums that were placed outside of cities where fresh air, rest, and separation from others was thought to help. In America, the first sanatorium was opened near Saranac Lake in upstate New York in 1885. Here you see a kind of grainy picture, I'm so, sorry about that of their cure cottages, as they called them, with open balconies where patients were supposed to rest and make sure fresh air was blowing around them. In reality, the separation helped reduce the spread of the disease, but almost half of those who entered sanatorium died within five years. 
It was not until the development of antibiotics after World War II that we had an effective cure and treatment. During World War II, given the crowding and malnutrition in concentration camps that you may get a sense of from a picture like this that was taken in a bunk in Birkenau, because of the crowding and malnutrition in the concentration camps, tuberculosis spread widely among prisoners. The Nazis often dealt with outbreaks of the disease just by killing all the people in the bunk or even in a, a larger camp population. But in the wake of the war, as Jewish prisoners moved into DP camps, they brought with them the tuberculosis bacillus. A 1951 study of the DP camps by the World Jewish Congress noted that in the period immediately after liberation, tuberculosis, they said, was rife among Jewish DPs. There was a particularly widespread epidemic that broke out in the summer of 1946 at the camp in Ferenwald where houses were built close together and where residents spent a lot of time in communal spaces. The camp was one of the largest in Germany with more than 5,000 residents in 1946. And by that summer, there were 382 TB cases identified. So one in about every 13 people in the camp had an active case of tuberculosis. There was a real fear that many others had contracted the disease and could, it, and could spread it further even if they weren't showing symptoms yet. The camp's central committee was moved to establish a committee of Jewish tubercular patients to provide both a voice for those who were infected and to urge ways to reduce the spread of the disease. The Allied authorities and the, U the United, Nation United Nations Relief Agency, who ran many of the camps, were aware of the dangers of the unchecked spread of tuberculosis and recognized the potential for camp residents to spread the disease as they moved out of the camps. So they began working with the Swiss Red Cross and other health organizations to create an elaborate testing campaign and enforced separation of TB patients into hospitals with special TB wards. The TB test of God Goldman was part of this campaign, instituted in the wake of the outbreak in Ferenwald in the summer of 1946, where God Goldman had spent a number of months. The fact that God Goldman did not have TB enabled him to continue his work with ORT at wind time, which turned into a larger job that he started in early 1947 with the joint that involved overseeing a number of JDC workshops and factories in and around Frankfurt and the German city of Kassel. This photograph shows him in his joint uniform he had gone from teaching classes to overseeing them at one camp to managing a much larger group of training and factory operations. After almost two years of working with the joint, he and his wife Sylvia, shown here in a photograph taken with friends when they were in the camp at Ferenwald, moved to Honduras, where they had some family who had settled earlier. And in 1951, they emigrated to the US settling in the Bronx and later moving to Far Rockaway. God's experience with Ort and the joint helped him get started in America, although he eventually settled into a long career working in finance for the Orthodox Union. He passed away after a full and remarkable life in 2007, and his wife followed four years later. His daughter, Marilyn, settled in Great Neck, connecting the family's history to Nassau County and our museum. The TB test turned out to be nothing more than a minor inconvenience for God Goldman that I'm guessing he thought very little about later on, even as he saved the x-ray and document. But it is a hint into one of the challenges that survivors faced as they lived in displaced persons camps and sought to restart their lives after the Holocaust. The Nazis not only murdered millions, but they created conditions in concentration camps that left even the survivors physically damaged and susceptible to diseases that many had not even recognized before the war. It was in the DP camps that survivors faced this more long lasting impact of Nazi imprisonment and health concerns, including tuberculosis, that became a high priority. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. Thank you for watching. And of course, if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A box and I'll try to answer them. 
Let me take a, a moment to remind you of some of our other upcoming programs. Next Tuesday, September 29th at 6 p.m., I'll be hosting an artist talk with master silver artist Michael Gallmer, focusing in particular on his sculpture, The Tears of the Holocaust, which he donated to HMTC in 2017. Next Wednesday, I'll be back at 11 o'clock for my next Curator's Corner. I'm going to be talking about a wedding dress in our collection that was brought to America by a Dutch Jewish couple as they fled from the Nazis on what counted as their honeymoon. And finally, next Thursday, October 1st at 6 p.m., Christina Cav Cavaria of the USHMM will present the Latin American response to the Holocaust, the examples of the Dominican Republic and Mexico. This is one of a couple of programs that we have scheduled to mark National Hispanic Heritage Month and that are being held in collaboration with the Nassau County Office of Hispanic Affairs and the NAACP and La Fuerza Unida. You can find a full list of our upcoming programs, of course, on our website, www.hmtcli.org, under the Events tab. And of course, please go to our website and make a donation and continue to support our virtual programs. Okay, let me take a look and see if some of you have posed any questions. Uh, I see that both Michael uh, Goldman and Marilyn Schneider are on the program and I want to thank them again uh, very much for their donation and for supporting HMTC. Somebody asked about what happened to God Goldman's sister. Uh, his one surviving sister moved to Israel and uh, as I understand it, God Goldman didn't realize for a long time that she had survived and she had found a place in Israel, although eventually they did reconnect and he saw her again in the 1960s and then a number of times after that. But for a long time, he thought he was the only survivor. Okay, thanks very much again for watching. I hope you have a nice afternoon and I look forward to seeing you at some of our other programs in the near future. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye-bye.